Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie. Good, good to talk to you again today. And uh, appreciate the fans tuning in to uh, our little broadcast here. So it's uh, all good. Life is good. Yes, it is. And uh, boy, what a show you guys had this past week. Of course, we saw Grand Slam on Wednesday and Friday, uh, a Rampage edition and a Dynamite edition. Man, ton of surprises. We saw uh, the former Page show up and we saw the acclaimed as the new champs and Jericho's the new champ and Moxley's the new champ. And by God, the great Muda in AEW, who'd have had it on their bingo card? Yeah, that's crazy, huh? I, I had no idea he was even going to be there. So that's good for me. I love those surprises. And, uh, but it was great seeing Muda. You know, he's, uh, he really got his career launched there at WCW back in the day. Absolutely. So, uh, it was kind of cool. Good thinking outside the box by Tony Khan, I thought. To, to get those guys, uh, it's quite the list of add-ons, you know, no doubt, uh, Paige Soraya, you know, I'm, I'm assuming she's going to be healthy enough to wrestle. I don't know. I'm assuming she is. So, uh, we'll see, you know, she's a, she's a positive addition. If so, no doubt. So it's good. Uh, he'll start a women's division. I think she was a good hand and still is a good hand. I'm hopeful that she's uh, healthy enough to go. So we'll see, as, uh, we said, before we started recording time, we'll tell, and we'll, we'll see how it works out. So interesting days lie ahead to say the least. And, uh, what a reaction the acclaimed guy, I- I'm curious. I know you were probably watching in the backstage area. Were you back there singing? Oh, so's me daddy with everybody else. I <laughs> know I, I missed that part. That's my, I missed my cue. Uh, no, uh, those kids got over. Yeah, they did. They've gotten over and, uh, it, it was a pleasant surprise that they got over as they have. So good stuff, man. I mean, you know, we're some of these young cats and are, 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 uh, finding their home and I like it. I like, I, I like that. Good, two good, two good athletic kids. And, uh, so, and their little gimmick, the scissor me thing and all that is seems to be working. Fans love it, man. It's, it's funny what gets over Connie, you know, it's funny what, uh, how that works. But, uh, if you told me six months ago, that this is going to be a big deal. I said, well, we'll see, but it it has been a a good deal. So I'm happy for those kids. You know, that's what you want. You want, you want young guys to find their way and all that good stuff. So it's all good, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy with where we are, quite honestly. And we'll have some fun with it. That's what we're here for. Yes, it is. And, uh, the real reason you and I are here today is we're going to talk about some pretty iconic moments from 25 years ago, as we're marching down and discussing all things WWF in 1997. Last week, we talked about ground zero where unfortunately you caught your very first stone cold stunner yeah. and, uh, <laughs> it was on the heels of Austin being dumped on his head at SummerSlam 99. He's got a forfeit, the tag titles. He's got a forfeit, the intercontinental title. Uh, but it doesn't matter. He's just months away from becoming the world champ and, uh, sitting on top of the world. And along the way, of course, we've uh, got to find things for him to do. He's got to stay out of the ring because he's still pretty sensitive with that neck. And well, what else can we do besides stun Jr? What if we stun Vince McMahon? And of course it happened, I believe at the first ever Monday night raw from Madison square garden. And before we talk about everything going on in 1997, Jim, from your perspective, uh, how did the McMahon family feel about the garden? Oh, it was the cathedral. It was a cathedral. And, uh, it, it is, the garden is a special place for anybody, any of us that had worked there. It's just something about the garden, right? It's a historic venue and, and, uh, it was great. It was great. They, they were, it was a special place, no doubt. And it still is a special place. I guess, uh, AEW has their special place now in New York city that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a, we've got a spot now. So yeah. I, I enjoyed that. I, I like that development. It's pretty good stuff. Well, of course, uh, it's not the only thing that happens on that night. There's so much to talk about in front of the camera, behind the camera. Let's just jump into it. 
I want to make mention of the fact that the open to this show has you narrating a really cool video that Meltzer would recap. The Madison Square Garden Raw opened with a nice clipping montage of the greats who had headlined the arena in the past, showing Hogan, Bruno, Slaughter, Patterson, Billy Graham, Savage, Piper, Andre, Ali, Mula, Liberace, Snuka, Morales, Backlund, etc. Really an awesome open. Now, you're on Raw just the night after you were stunned uh, at Ground Zero, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and you even open the show here, narrating this really cool video. And it, it does feel like once upon a time, the, the company has sort of gone back and forth with embracing the history of the company based on whoever was passing down an edict at the time, if you will. So just to clarify, this is 1997. Hogan is probably the top star in the business again, and it's happening on the other channel as he's leading the NWO, but they still make the decision to include him and Piper and so many others who were a big part of those early WrestleManias, especially WrestleMania one, the very first one that happened right, right there in the garden. Were you surprised that Vince, cause it does feel like, you know, just one year prior we're doing the huckster and the nacho man. And even in this era, you're sort of mocking the presentation of those guys on the other channel is age in the cage and all that, but it is a tip of the cap to WWF history. Were you surprised McMahon went back and forth like that? Uh, not really, because uh, I'm glad that he didn't, he didn't ignore these guys. I thought that was important that they, they were not ignored. Their contributions were recognized and some, there's been points in our history where the uh, history was recognized, but not in a very favorable way. I don't know how you have a history of WrestleMania, uh, and, and, uh, events, WWE events and the garden Conrad that, uh, you know, they just, it was just, a. I, I thought it was a no brainer, quite frankly, how do you not do Piper and Hogan and all these things? So, uh, anyway, it was, uh, I thought it was appropriate and a timely, quite frankly. Well, speaking of timely, you know, in, in an old school way, and obviously you like being a, a part of all the big shows and it doesn't get much bigger than the first Monday night raw from Madison square garden, but all right. would in hindsight, was it the right call to have you on the call the day after you were still in, or since you're quote unquote, oh, yeah. an announcer, should you have been out for a while? Well, there's two ways of looking at that. Obviously, uh, I think, I think we got by with it. Okay. You know, uh, it wasn't a pile driver. It wasn't something that was, you know, going to keep me out of business. So it was, it's good. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, the, the other news and notes here. We've got an opening match here with the intercontinental title first round tournament between the now heel Rocky Mavia taking on Ahmed Johnson and the match goes four minutes, 50, 57 seconds. Uh, Ahmed's going to cut his hand banging into the ring steps, but he does get the pin over Rocky Mavia with the Pearl river plunge. Um, this is a, a, a fresh coat of paint for Rocky Mavia now that he's a heel and I, this feud with the nation of domination and Ahmed Johnson just seemingly has no end in sight, but Ahmed gets the nod here. And I know in hindsight, a lot of people say, man, I can't believe I'm going to beat the rock, but the rock is still trying to find his voice. And for the, for the better part of the last two years, Ahmed Johnson's been right on the cusp of being a main eventer for this promotion. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, it, it just shows the commitment that Vince had in Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed got several opportunities to go, you know, so it was kind of cool, but I, I, no, I had no problem with it. I thought it was good. And we just tripped, kept trying. You want you talk about somebody finding their voice. You know, we were hoping that we get Ahmed to the level that we could admire his work and and uh, all that stuff. So uh, I don't know how I don't know how I don't know how you do it better. Uh, you're just trying to get this guy over, and I thought it was very uh, admirable that Dwayne was happy to do the honors. It shows what kind of team player Dwayne Johnson was and is. So uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting. Interesting timing. You know, you go back in a different time frame, like right now, you go back and look at it. So well, I don't understand why they beat rock. Well, rock wasn't rock was beatable at that point in time. Yeah. And, uh, it seemed like it worked out pretty well. 
Yeah, it did work out pretty well for the rock. Maybe not for Ahmed Johnson. This is his last pinfall victory on raw is war in his entire WWF career. Um, at times it just felt like Ahmed's run was sort of snake bit. I mean, here he is getting a win in in the intercontinental title tournament. And even here he gets hurt And, and I'm not saying the guy was injury prone. It just feels like he did have a string of bad luck and there's lots of stops and starts as a result, but Hey, if you can't make it to the finish line, it kind of is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we, I think uh, we gave Ahmed every fair opportunity to get over. Uh, it's just, he had, so he had a run of bad luck and, and so forth. So, uh, it was, uh, interesting times, as we said, it's just, you hope that the guy will get healthy and get on a roll and, and his body, uh, his look presentation was going to be uh, solid so you can see that we have big plans for Ahmed they just didn't work out let's talk a little bit about uncle Cletus uh th- this is um kind of an interesting chain of events once upon a time we had teal hopper running around here uh but but that is no longer the case uh we're looking for a a a new uh a new coat of paint for him as well so we're going to make him the third Godwin, uh, uncle Cletus is the name we're going with. And listen, this sort of idea in hindsight, a lot of people probably poke fun at, but for whatever reason, maybe it's because he's a self-described North Carolina redneck. Vince really liked the, the hillbilly or redneck characters. He seems like he's had one almost from day one, right? Yeah, it, it did. He was, he had no problem with those. It kind of harkened back to his childhood. Cause that's how he was raised just blue collar, you know, type deal. And so he had a, he had a, he had a role. He, he we were going to go with him. It just didn't work out. Sometimes that's how it goes. I mean, you know, it's obvious that we, we, uh, we had plans for him, but it just didn't work out. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, the, the Brian Pillman gold dust Marlena storyline. It's continuing with filming, filming more Pillman, filming more of these triple X files and showing them where these guys are in hotel rooms. Of course, he's won the rights to Marlena for 30 days. Uh, and thankfully everybody's being professional during this, but you're running talent relations. Are you having any closed door meetings with any of the three about them being uncomfortable? Or is it just sort of apparent that maybe there's some uneasiness? Uh, no, they, they, uh, pulled off that angle pretty well. I thought, uh, well, quite frankly, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's just another way of just trying to build somebody, trying to get somebody hot Conrad, just trying to get somebody that uh, the audience is going to care about. And, uh, no, they work very hard on that angle. And I don't recall any significant issues, quite frankly. Uh, between the, the, the participants, they, they all got, they've got better bookings. I mean, they got more TV time. They got everything that they, you know, they wanted in that respect, television time. So then you maximize your minutes and you rock and roll. And I think, I think that's kind of where we were with that deal. Today's episode is brought to you by car shield who makes it easy and affordable to protect my car from expensive repairs. And that's just for starters. Car shield is the number one auto protection company in the U S and offers protection plans for around a hundred bucks a month. The plans cover more parts than ever before, whether your car has 5,000 miles or 150,000 miles. And let me tell you how simple it is to get your car fixed. When you need a repair, you choose the mechanic and car shields administrators handle the rest. That's it. You don't have to deal with the paperwork or headaches you're taking care of. Same goes if your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road. Plans through CarShield also include coast-to-coast roadside assistance. CarShield administrators are there for you with rental car options and trip reimbursement at no extra cost, too. Get coverage today, and you'll lock in your price now, and it will never go up. That means as long as you own your car, no matter how old it is, you're protected from the rising cost of parts and repairs for your vehicle. CarShield helps protect my wallet from expensive car repairs, and they'll do the same for you. Go to carshield.com slash podcast to start your plan and lock in your pricing forever. That's carshield.com slash podcast. A deductible may apply. 
So talk to me a little bit about, um, Steve Austin here. We're going to see him in the stands and the fans are just all over him. Huge reaction. He's over like Rover as a friend of ours would say. Uh, and he's promising that someone is getting their ass whipped tonight. At this point, is he one of the hottest talents as far as just crowd response you've ever seen? Like you had seen the dying days of Hogan here in the WWF and you had seen the height of JYD in mid South, right? But the way they're responding to him here, does it feel different than all the other quote unquote over guys you had seen? Yeah, absolutely. He was special and, uh, and the crowd responded accordingly. He was the hottest single star that, uh, that I had ever been around. And I, like you pointed out, I've been around some guys when they were hotter than heck and, uh, and seemed to do really well. And, and, and certainly, uh, uh, that, that was the case here. Austin has kept getting hotter and hotter. And we've mentioned this on the show. The audience was very content if they just got to see Steve, you know, having a match is one thing and important, but uh, him, uh, having his pr- presence on television, uh, still there, uh, was seen to work. And uh, every time he came out, it was like a huge pop and he was loved and be loved and all that stuff. So, uh, it was, uh, nobody I'd ever been around it was ever as hot as uh, stone cold was during that period of time. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, these funny, silly uh, advertisements that we would record because once upon a time we used to have the Kung Fu fighters and. Uh, all the silly little promos that we would do that, that I'm sure moved a lot of product. They're still built into the program all these years later on the network, but here we even see one on the network with uh, Sable and the Fink in a laser tag showdown. I mean, listen, I understand that this is essentially, um, paid programming. That's like an endorsement spot and it's part of the show, but being an old school guy, did you hate that stuff or no? I don't know if I hated it. I was, I questioned the, uh, I I questioned the validity of it at times. Uh, but you know, here's the same situation that we had with Austin. If, uh, you get a chance to see more Sable, it's like the Austin thing. She's not going to go out there and dazzle you with her wrestling. It's her presence. It's what made that thing work. And again, like I said, to compare Sable to Austin in the sense that Austin was, uh, the fans were content to see Austin in a non wrestling role. And even though this match is built as a, as a match, it really wasn't, it was just a showcase to, you know, expose Sable. Right. And, it, and, uh, we were lucky we had her and, and that the fans, uh, there was a demand to see more of her, uh, on, on TV. And, uh, it seemed like the audience was happy with that, that arrangement. No doubt about it. Uh, we're also going to take a look back at one night only, which was two nights prior over in England. Uh, and man, oh man, there's so much to discuss here. We recently discussed this show uh, on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard, but it's where Sean beat the bulldog for the European title after Davey had promised the title win and sort of dedicated it to his sister who was sick with cancer. Right. And allegedly Sean had politicked as the story goes to, to win the belt. But Bruce would say, well, now hang on. And Meltzer agreed in a traditional wrestling sense, rather than give away your first UK pay-per-view, because that's what this is prior to this show, all of the pay-per-views for the UK had been free, but this is a UK pay-per-view exclusive. The first time we're charging money for pay-per-view for a WWF program. And we don't want to just give them exactly what they're looking for here. Let's build some heat. And then come back in the spring and then pay it off. Bulldog gets the big win. So when that was all explained, I could sort of get with it. Now, the trouble with that is we know that the Montreal screw job is going to happen in November. So we never come back in spring. Bulldog's gone. Brett's gone. Sean's gone. Nobody's even here come spring. Um, in hindsight, if you had it to do over again, would you, or was that the right call for business? Because, Hey, we're trying to build to the next show, man. Well, it was likely the best call for business, quite frankly. Uh, I like Bruce's logic, uh, and you know, to, to have the screw job and, and Sean, uh, go over, 
I just didn't like the way it was all handled. Yeah. Uh, it seemed to be a little, <clears throat> you know, back, back room deal, you know, and cause when we got to TV that, that day in, in England, uh, the game plan was all the way, you know, Bulldog's going to go over. And I didn't even think anything other than that, quite frankly, that when Sean went over, it was a surprise. Right. And, uh, nobody saw that coming and maybe, and maybe that's simply enough. Maybe that's good enough. I don't know, but I didn't like the way the business was handled going into it, but I don't have a problem with the way the, uh, the end result was it didn't kill me. So that's kind of how I looked at that deal. Conrad, it was just the process was a little dubious, but, uh, the logic behind it, uh, didn't make some sense. And, uh. And it was, and they, you know, like Eric says, uh, <clears throat> controversy creates cash and there's certainly ample controversy, uh, in that match. You got a, a guy who's dedicated the match to his dying sister who's dying of cancer. Yeah. And she, and she passed away not too long after that. So you think this is almost an automatic that, uh, you know, it's not going to be an issue, but it was an issue to, to a lot of people and a lot of people didn't see it coming. I think that's a good trait. Surprises are good in wrestling, so, but just to have a surprise for surprise sake probably isn't the best logic, but uh, it worked out well. It worked. I thought it worked out pretty good. It was you left there with heat controversy and people talking. And I think sometimes that's enough. Talk to me uh, a little bit about the bulldog here because Sean Michaels would write in his book that Davey was raised in the business where. You didn't just confront problems head on. You sort of just bury people in the back. And he basically says that bulldog didn't really raise his hand and protest or anything like that in any sort of forum that would have been conducive for a resolution, but instead just kind of shit on everybody behind the scenes. You're running talent relations at the time. Do you remember this being an issue for bulldog or was it something that he kept out of your office? Uh, it, it really stayed out of my area, uh, which I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, quite frankly. Uh, so it, it was just one of those, one of those scenarios where probably two right answers in that deal. If bulldog had gone over, then we'd understood we get it. He's dedicating the, the match to his wife or excuse me, his, uh, uh, sister, you know, sister, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, it just didn't materialize. So. I don't know, Connie, I, I, there's a way to look at it and say, well, that we did the right thing at the end of the day, which I think is the way to go on this one. Uh, or, uh, you know, Vince, that Sean talking out of what seemed to be a logical finish. Uh, but you know, like I said, it didn't, it didn't end the, it didn't, it didn't adversely affect anything overly crazy, but it was, it was controversial to say the least. So let's talk about, uh, the undertaker. He's going to do an interview here and Sean Michaels is going to come out on the ramp and give him a tongue lashing. And, uh, speaking of Sean interviews from the week prior, well, here we go. This is for, directly from the observer. Probably the biggest news of the past week revolved around Sean Michaels behavior at the raw taping on September 9th in Muncie, Indiana. Uh, neither Vince nor the undertaker were at the taping and Michaels did an interview where he came out in tight biker shorts with socks uh, stuffed into his crotch for whatever reason, and proceeded to make some very lewd gyrations. Like he was humping Jim Ross swearing during his interview <laughs> and called out the undertaker who was on tape on the video wall. Everything was able to be edited off of the show. And if you didn't know about the incident, you wouldn't even know the interview was heavily edited, but since the undertaker wasn't there and he was on tape, the un uh, Sean Michaels kept insulting him, calling him a big chicken shit, begging him to come out, calling him more names. And when he didn't come out. It made the undertaker look bad in the city, not to mention it was totally unprofessional. Whether Michaels was doing it in another attempt to get fired so he could go to WCW or he had other ideas up his sleeve. Now Vince isn't there, but you are, and you're in the ring with him. When this is going on, I recently asked Bruce about this and Bruce said he didn't make it his business to check guys crotches before they walked out the curtain from, from, uh, <laughs> the gorilla position. So oh, he come on, Brucey. So you he looked. didn't know, well, <laughs> well, we know if Tony Schiavone was there, we would have, we would have known that was an issue, 
Uh, <laughs> but, but Bruce didn't see it. And you obviously do because Sean keeps jumping up and down and crotch chopping right in your face. So you see it yeah. and you know, he's going off script and, and saying language that can't be on the program and really bearing the baby face here. How pissed were you in the ring? And this is happening. Well, I was a little pissed. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I thought it was unnecessary. Uh, and so, yeah, it was, un, uh, I, I didn't expect it. I had no idea what they were going to do in the interview. Uh, so it was just one of those things, man. It's just part of the job. Got to be prepared for, uh, uh, rainy rain, or got to be prepared for sunshine. And that was a little bit of both. It was a very entertaining interview that people still talk about such as us right now, but, uh, I wasn't crazy about it. To be honest with you. I just thought it was unprofessional in a lot of ways. So he comes back through the curtain. Obviously you're having to stay in character, uh, right. and, and, and you're still going to go call the show, but you're also head of talent relations. Mm-hmm. What's, uh, as, as Bruce says, uh, he thinks Sean got one of the biggest fines in history up to that point. And eventually McMahon sort of changes course on it. Several weeks later, it sort of clicks for Vince. And he says that this segment was attitude and it was Sean Michael showing attitude and the word attitude for the attitude era was born largely because of this interview. And even McMahon himself sort of did a one eighty on it. What do you remember about finding Sean and Vince sort of changing course with the way he approached this type of behavior? Well, I'm glad that he did. I'm glad that Vince made a decision that, uh, would indicate you don't go off script in such, especially in such an important, uh, matter that involved Shawn Michaels and the undertaker. So, uh, I, it, it, we had to go do a lot of backpedaling. I had a lot, as you would say, had, there was a lot to unpack there, but, uh, Vince signing or, or finding rather, uh, Sean was a little, a little bit of a surprise. I don't never, I never remembered what the, the, uh, the amount of the fine was, but I do remember it being significant. Um, what's the undertaker's issue. Do you hear about that? Or is it something that again, you, you're able to, to dodge? Well, uh, you know, taker, uh, had, uh, had an open mic to the judge, right? and named Vince McMahon and, and, uh, but you know, Vince didn't give him a free pass. That was the thing about it is that I think a lot of talents were surprised that Sean got fined and, uh, it showed that Vince still was in control and that when we had something go off script, it was, uh, sometimes a little bit awkward, shall we say. And that was just because of Sean and Sean's attitude. And he was such a valuable player that, uh, you know, you don't know what's going to stick and what's not going to stick Conrad. It was, it wasn't a great, it wasn't a fun gig at at that time. You know, the controversy is good. I get that, but sometimes we took things a little bit too far. And, uh, that was one of those situations. Uh, I think, I don't know that Sean would have done anything nearly the way he did. If Taker had been present, just don't see that happen. So it was, uh awkward to say the least. And then you wonder how that's going to be, uh, addressed, uh, later. And, uh, and I know that Sh- Taker and Sean, because the, the idea was to get them into a position to draw money and ratings and pay-per-view buys and all that good stuff. So it was, a it was, it was challenging. It wasn't, it wasn't fun, but, uh, it was just a, it was part of that journey to get to the, the end game, which is Sean and Taker in a main event on pay-per-view. It's, uh, it's just fascinating to take a look at, you know, all that's happening here in front of the camera and, and behind the scenes. Um, it's a very tumultuous time. And and there's so many things we could point to in 1997 and say, well, this was unprofessional. That was unprofessional. Uh, clearly we're just a few months removed from the backstage fight with Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Uh, we're about six months, seven months out from Shawn forfeiting the title because he lost his smile. Uh, and there's more shenanigans on the way, but at this point, this in-ring promo with Shawn Michaels, him crotch chopping you, calling out the baby face, et cetera, et cetera, 
is this the most unprofessional thing you've seen and dealt with in the WWF at this point? Yeah. To that point it was, yeah. it was, uh, it's, it's hard to handle an issue that she had not experienced before. Uh, you know, uh, it was just crazy, uh, quite frankly. And how do you handle this? Well, we'll handle it like we did the last time. Well, there was no last time, right? Nothing had been like this, uh, uh, prior, at least to, on, my, on that level, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, it was unprofessional as hell. And again, it came out of nowhere. You know, I didn't know Sean was going to stuff his tights or his pants or whatever with socks and all that stuff. I didn't, what was the reason for it? Right. You know, wh wh why, why, why did that work or did it not work? So, uh, yeah, it was right. It ranks right there with poor taste because that's what it was. It was done in poor taste. So let's talk about, you know, Vince's decision, like just on the heels of this crazy interview, you know, we're finding him and it feels like, man, this is the type of behavior that's going to get a guy suspended instead. No, let's, let's have him, let's take him over to England and let him beat bulldog. It's just, wait a minute. What the, the reward for this is a European title. Yes. It's a fine, but it's business as usual. And, and we're banking on him and we're moving forward with the European title. That's a real head scratcher. And, and I can't imagine that it wouldn't have been for you. Like, uh, as we like to say a lot of times here on the show, I can't imagine the cowboy doing that. <laughs> yeah. No, it would not have happened on a cowboy's watch. It might've happened, but it would have been, it would have been, uh, the penalty would have been significant. He wouldn't and, have won uh, a title a, a few weeks later. Yeah. No. Uh, let's, so, let's talk about what's next here on the show. Uh, we've got LOD beating Farouk and Kama Mustafa by DQ in two and a half minutes because D'Lo and Rocky Mavia are going to interfere. Meltzer would call it pretty bad. Uh, Johnson did a run in, but they had uh, four on three on him. There was no heat for the post-match. And finally the officials broke it up and they announced that even though Shamrock had beaten Farouk last week, that Farouk would advance in the tournament because of Shamrock's injury. So Johnson versus Farouk is going to be the semifinal. That's going to be taped on September 23rd in Albany, New York. The idea here is Shamrock isn't able to perform, uh, because he's been injured, uh, and they're trying to let him rest up before he has to go do this FMW shot against Vader, which I guess was a cash deal with the WWF. Uh, and listen, they've been working on Johnson and Farouk since 1996. So it's cool to have that one again. Um, before we get to the next match, we should probably at some point talk about what happened before the program went on the air. As the story goes, this is that legendary show, September 22nd, 1997, Madison square garden, the first raw from MSG. And we're almost a year from that October, 1996 raw where Bret Hart comes back and reveals that he has decided to resign with the WWF. And we know it's for like a 20 year deal. But on this particular show here, September 22nd, 1997, Brett shows up a little late to the show. Surprise, typical Brett <laughs> stuff. But that's when Vince sits him down and says, Hey man, I can't honor your contract. See if you can get that WCW offer again. And you're running talent relations. So you have to know that this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. When did you know it was going to happen? How did you feel about that being the circumstance and Vince is going to go share the news. And just to give everyone the context, you're not just sharing this with a, this news with a performer and, and a heritage performer, but your current champion. I mean, Brett still has the title here. All right. This, as far as I know that nothing like this had ever happened before in wrestling. Uh, certainly not in the WWF. Talk me through this because you're ahead of talent relations and just want to know what you knew, when you knew and, and how all it went down. Well, I got, uh, you know, Vince and I discussed this matter and it just, it became a matter of economics. Uh, obviously Vince was right on the right point on, you know, business was not great. Uh, ticket sales were soft and, uh, this was a significant investment in money and time. Uh, but nobody wants to lose a Bret Hart. Uh, you know, to me, Bret Hart was, a, a amazing, uh, asset for our company. And, uh, it was just unfortunate that, that, you know, Vince had made this commitment, maybe thinking that we were going to be okay. Wasn't okay. 
uh, but it was the heartbreaking, the fact that, uh, a talent, uh, like Bret Hart, uh, was not going to be able to do business with us because of economics. And I, it was regretful. I mean, you know, Brett was such a key part of what we were doing. And Brett was like a, other talents, Conrad, in the fact that he, he commanded a great deal of respect, uh, from the locker room. Brett was a very popular guy in the locker room because he helped so many people, uh, with their matches their psychology, and, uh, just a, a voice to listen to. So losing Brett was significant for us. Uh, and it just didn't seem like the right W it didn't seem like it was the WWE that we all loved, uh, because Brett was no longer going to be a part of the equation. So it was, uh, it was a big loss in my, in my estimation. You know, uh, we can get by with Brett being late here and there and things of that nature. It's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world either. So, uh, I, I was a big, big fan of Brett's all the way around still on this very day. He's one of my best friends and I, I have a great deal of respect for him. So, uh, it, it was, it hurt us. It was, it hurt us. And it's just, again, it was just a matter of dollars and cents, you know, uh, I, I wish it was, it was another example of poor communication, you know, it should have got to this point. Uh, you know, you that's what you think and that's what you hope. So it was, a, it was challenging Conrad to, to be thinking about moving forward, which I had to do because of the job that I had. Uh, it was just tough. It was tough. Uh, you don't want to lose it. It's like losing Tom Brady. You know, he, he, he just, it was just sad. And is this what, is this, what, is this the hand that we're dealt with and, and this we're left with? So it was not good. It was, it was, and it was, it was bad around the locker room too, because I think it got more heat on Sean because, you know, if, if Brett had been happier and had, didn't have all the distractions and all the, all the BS, uh, then Brett may have stayed. We don't know. We'll never know, but it was a tough, tough loss for us to say the least with Sean or excuse me with the with Brett and some of Brett's consternation was going to be attributed to the interactions with Sean. Right. They just, they, they just carried it with them and it never got behind them. And until later, uh, but right now at this point in time, you know, you're handing WCW this great talent that's going to make them better. And unfortunately for Brett and WCW, you know, injuries caught up with him too. And, uh, so it was, uh, it was tough. I, I missed Brett. I missed being around him. I missed, you know, having a, Hey, Brett, I got the question. I got a question for you. What do you think about this? Right. And you'd always get a timely and honest answer. So, uh, I, 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 I missed that whole process with him. He was just so valuable to us and probably that's probably been taken for granted a little bit. You know, the controversy over the controversy overshadowed Brett's contributions unfortunately and uh so i i i i was i was it was regretful it's like losing it like i said you, everything is cool until tom brady gets hurt right and then it ain't so cool anymore so uh that was what brett was to me was our tom brady and and he deserved that accolade because of of his contributions and and what he meant to the team and I don't think we talk about that in our wrestling business enough because of the fact that it's fictional and so forth. Uh, it just was hard. It's just really hard, bigger than me, bigger than we are positioning it today. Probably to lose Bret Hart was, uh, just, uh, devastating. Do you think in hindsight, you know, just as far as, you know, trying to be pragmatic, if you will. It was a mistake for Vince to have this conversation while Brett was still champion. Should he have found a way to creatively get the belt off of him? Or did you guys all feel like, well, out of respect to Brett, let's just be gun blue true with him and just, Hey, here's where it is and operate in good faith. But then in the end, of course, we know it's going to become a mess and hurt feelings all around. And is it easy just to say with the benefit of hindsight? Yeah, we should have got it off him creatively and then handled our business or where do you land on that? Well, I probably would have done that. I probably figured out with Brett is, uh, to his, uh, liking an angle storyline, a way to get the title off of him, uh, would have been, uh, obviously a necessity, Yeah, but that's not what happened. Unfortunately, no. 
and it should have happened. It should have happened. And I don't think Brett would have had too many issues depending on who, uh, who he dropped the title to. He was still proud of his, his legacy and so forth. Uh, we just needed to find the right guy that would help Brett could help by losing to them for the title. And it is just, it was just horrible. It was just horrible. I don't think people again, realize the significance of Brett uh, not being the champion and Brett being, uh, you know, no longer in the company. Right. So it was, uh, it was a hard pill to swallow to say the least. As far as, uh, procrastination and, uh, maybe that's not the right word for it, but it does feel as if Vince maybe procrastinated a little bit here with the, the approach and, and how we're going to get the belt off because this is September 22nd. Uh, so we've got maybe six, seven weeks, something like that before the whole Montreal screw job thing happens. It does feel as if maybe there's a lesson to be learned there. Do you think Vince, you were around Vince before and after did yeah. his approach to the way he handled things <clears throat> like this. I mean, did you think Vince was procrastin procrastinating here? Well, I think he had second thoughts because it was such a major decision. Yeah. And let's don't forget that Vince had great respect for Brett. Brett had been front and center, uh, for so long. It's just sometimes you almost take those things for granted. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think Vince procrastinated a little bit and he had second thoughts on his own decision. Sure. That happened all the time. Yeah. And so you got to go with one decision or the other. And I think that's kind of what, what the situation was. We, we made it, he made the decision reluctantly. Didn't have a great, uh, I don't think he had a lot of feel for it, quite frankly, or he wouldn't have had vacillated. So, so, uh, readily. Right. So there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of emotions that Vince had to handle. And, uh, he was torn between his, uh, trying to get Shawn Michaels on par and, uh, and then handling the bread issue, two distinctly different issues, even right. though they overlapped. Yes. But I feel strongly that saving money is important. You know, if it's not something we worry about now, boy, we are really going to worry about it later. And I want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments. I'm talking to you if you're in a 30 year loan. Now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut five, 10, even 15 years off their loan. And you can do this without perfect credit with no money out of pocket. You've just got to start at savewithconrad.com. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, the, the financial state of the company. Um, there's a famous story out there that boy, things were, were so lean here in 96 and, and, and into 97 that we took the water coolers out of the building. And I think, uh, not too long ago, Kevin Kelly was even talking about how some of the cost cutting measures that Titan handed down included, Hey, sharpen your pencils instead of throwing them away. And don't forget to turn the lights off in the bathroom when you finish up and I mean, little silly stuff because it really was that tight to the point where I think Bruce even tells the story that Vince had to, as he would often remind people, take whatever the number was, four, five, six million dollars, quote unquote, out of my own ass because the company had lost money and Vince had to write a check to sort of fund the losses. That doesn't feel like the WWE that we know these days, of course, you know, they're, they're hitting record revenues every year, but that was not the case here. So right. there's a lot of times where fans can be, and myself included, pretty critical of the decision to handle Brett the way they did. But if we're saying, don't forget to turn the lights out when you leave the bathroom and sharpen your pencils, <laughs> uh, things are tight, right? Yeah. Well, some of us took pay cuts. Yes. I, I, I uh, got a $50,000, uh, pay cut. I do remember that vividly. And it, it, the mending was about was with our HR person who was kind of nuts, uh, Lisa Wolf, uh, and my meeting with her in Vince lasted maybe five minutes. Hey, you know, we're, we're tough I, and, and it, it, things are tough, but if we survive this and we get through this as we expect that we will, uh, you're going to be okay. And I'm going to take care of you. And he did. Yeah. That's before we went public and I got stock and I got, you know, all kinds of nice little things to make me happy. And it just, you, know, you got to vest, you got to take some time to get vested. And, uh, so, but when you know that there's money coming in later on, 
when the stocks uh, vest and they mature, then uh, that's where you are. So it was a uh, it was a tough time. You know, there's a lot of emotions floating around, and everybody had their little camp. Uh, but you had a lot of guys that were pro Brit uh, in this whole matter, and it didn't seem to get the attention that it, it should have. I know this sounds silly, but uh, a lot of folks who listen to this don't know Vince McMahon, myself included. I don't really know Vince. Uh, I've had the good fortune of meeting and conversating with him several times, but I don't really know him like you do. Was Vince nervous about having this conversation with Brett? Does he, do you know what's coming ahead of time? And does he tell you after just some sort of brief it's done? I did it. I mean, is it something that he was dreading look, doing or just talk us through that? I'm sure he was dreading doing it because Brett was such a staunch WWE guy. Yeah. And he is dedicated to the company. Uh, he had served the company well. So yeah, I, I can't imagine Vince not having some, uh, uh, second thoughts. Yeah. Cause there's, like I said, there's just, it was a tough, it was a tough uh, dilemma to work your way out of. So it was, uh, it was challenging Probably the most challenging times in Vince's, uh, career to have to cut a guy like, uh, uh Brett. So I, I, I think it was hard, hard for him, hard for Vince, quite frankly. And, uh, and, and why wouldn't it be right? How could it not be right? So that's kind of where we were on that matter. Well, on the program, the next thing we would see is Owen Hart beating Brian Pillman by DQ in seven and a half minutes. And they announced that Goldust and Marlena are going to renew their wedding vows on raw in Kansas city on October 6th, uh, which Meltzer would say will no doubt lead to an angle. Uh, Marlena came out wearing a dog collar and Pillman talked about giving it to her in the position with her bent over the two started having a fake, fake match, as opposed to a real fake match until Marlena hit Owen with her purse and blamed Pillman. They came back and brawled for a few minutes until Goldust got in, uh, in the ring and slugged Owen while he was trying to get to Pillman. And somehow it rules it's ruled that Owen is the winner by DQ. So he's now going to go on to the finals of the tournament against whoever wins between Ahmed Johnson and Farouk. Of course, Austin comes in, jumps Owen and the Keystone cops hit the ring to arrest Owen. Um, the match is really just a backdrop to all the angles, both Pillman and Marlena. And of course, eventually fans really want to see Austin. And here it is. There you go. Um, let's talk about what's next here. McMahon jumps out of his chair and gives a speech to Austin about how everyone cares about him and just doesn't want to see him wind up in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Austin acts like he finally understands that they're trying to do what's in his best interest, but then he gives McMahon the stunner to a huge pop. The police then cuff Austin, drag him out. And, uh, he bends over while he's in cuffs to flip off McMahon Lawler and Jr. act like Austin would be fired for sure for attacking the owner of the company. And Meltzer says the gimmick as best I can tell is that Austin's matches will be non-sanctioned matches. Once he can come back, at least for a while, McMahon sold it as if he were dead. But once the cameras got off, people live thought McMahon got up too easily and walked off with Patterson. Now, I don't know about that. We didn't see it on camera, but what an angle, what a setup, what a moment we would see this, uh, stunner, one of the worst stunners you could ever see on replays forever and ever, but then. Austin taunting, uh, McMahon and, uh, really grinning ear to ear as he's hauled up the ramp by the police. This became a classic Monday night raw moment. When yeah. you first heard the creative, I mean, clearly you had just caught a stunner yourself, but did you know what a, what a huge landmark moment this was going to be for the company? Well, I had a feeling it's going to be significant and it yeah. was, yes, it was, uh, uh it was as, as significant as any angle that we had done on raw and maybe ever. You know, Vince getting involved in physicality, uh, it just put that marriage together. Uh, and let's not forget you know, what that attitude between McMahon and Austin meant. It was huge. Uh, it couldn't have booked it any better because, uh, it just, it was perfect. The timing was good. Vince's character was spot on. He was the best heel we had in the attitude era. And, uh, you know, 
we kept the baby face in jeopardy, baby face meaning Austin. So, uh, because you knew that Vince is going to get retribution and Vince had more soldiers in his army than Austin did, which again, puts the baby face in jeopardy and, uh, uh, outmanned, shall we say, but that was Austin's. He, he loved that because it, it showed him overcoming all obstacles and it worked out really well. I thought, I thought anyway. Talk to me about Bulldog Brower. When we come back from commercial, they're going to have a little clip mentioning the death of Bulldog Brower. Not something that we saw a lot in this era. And I have to admit back then, I didn't know a doggone thing about Bulldog Brower, but an old timer from way back. Tell us about what you remember about the Bulldog. Well, he wrestled mostly, uh, he's Canadian. He wrestled a lot in Kansas city for Bob Geigel. So that was his claim to fame. He had, he kind of pitched a, uh, you know, that was his home, home base, but he was a, he was a, a solid hand, uh, you know, and, but he was just a, he was, a, he wasn't extraordinary, but he had, he had a lot of work over the years and, and, uh, and, and seemed to make a living, but you know, he was, he was a solid hand mid card guy who extended his career by doing what Bob Goggle wanted. And, and kept his spot there and nice and healthy. So, uh, that was, it, I was a little s- surprised quite frankly, that we acknowledged it. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad that we did. It didn't hurt anything. Totally agree. Uh, in my research, I saw that he did, uh, come work for Vincent J McMahon, uh, where uh, he would even have some, some headline opportunities against Bruno in 66, 69 and 70. Uh, he would briefly feud with Pedro, who was the champ in 71. And then he's going to leave the company for a bit. He does pop back over from like 79 to 82 and hangs around with Captain Lou. But uh, it's it's really cool to see wrestling acknowledge its history because that wasn't always the case. So nice to see it done here. And then there's another iconic moment where we have a little tip of the cap to history. And it's something that I know you were really proud of. Dude love is scheduled to take on Hunter Hearst Helmsley in a false count anywhere match, but they're going to do a video that airs on the jumbotron where dude love says it's not really his kind of match and mankind comes into the frame. So now we've got dude love sitting next to mankind and he says, it's not really my kind of match either. And they introduce cactus Jack. So this is the full iteration of three faces for Foley. And Mick Foley's talked about on his podcast recently, Foley is pod, how this was put together where, you know, it was a painstaking process, especially back then it took hours upon hours to film this, but cactus Jack, a character Mm -hmm. that Vince McMahon probably told you a thousand times would never appear in the world wrestling (laughs) federation is not only here, but he's debuting in a fantastic, super memorable segment that people still talk about to this day. And in Madison square garden of all places where Foley himself used to hitchhike to go see Jimmy Snuka fly off the cage. What a big moment this was for Mick and probably a little bit of validation for good old JR, right? Well, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I didn't look at it that way, but, uh, I always had great confidence in Mick's ability and, uh, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna win. He's gonna, he's gonna get over. And, uh, the fact he got over his three different iterations, is somewhat astonishing. Yeah. Uh, and I was happy for Mick cause, uh, we have many long talks about the future and, and all these things, uh, how, th- how things are going to eventually work out as we hoped and we saw. So, uh, yeah, I was happy for Mick that night and, and being in the garden was so special for him and, and everybody else, quite frankly. So it was, uh, it was some good stuff. Uh, it was some good stuff. And I was really proud of Mick, quite frankly. Fantastic match. Go out of your way to see it. Uh, there was some sort of chemistry. I mean, crazy chemistry between Foley and Hunter. Uh, and we're seeing it here in a big way. Uh, when he first comes through, man, there's huge, and I mean, huge ECW chance. Um, I, I, I just love the match. I love the finish. I love, you know, the, the pile driver through the table on the top of the ramp, just really, really good stuff. Top to bottom. And a pretty special Monday night raw somehow continues to just get more and more special. Could you have imagined a better place to debut cactus Jack than in the garden? No, no, it was perfect. Perfect timing, perfect venue. Great reason for doing it. Just, uh, it worked. 
it worked. Mick was coming home. And, uh, that's kind of how I saw it. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure that before the, the match, uh, I had no idea what the finish was going to be. I was hoping that we would get Mick over and he could get over by not winning, but that's harder. It's harder. Uh, but it was a perfect setup. I thought, I don't know how we could have done it any better. Uh, no venue is going to ser service this account, shall we say? Uh, better than what we did is perfect. Big recommendation. You know, lots of times we talk about stuff here on the show and we, and we acknowledge that, man, that really doesn't age all that. Well, this one does, it stands the test of time, go back and watch it. Uh, next up on the show, we've got Sean Michaels doing an interview. He's going to call out the undertaker, almost doing a spoof of what was edited off the show from Muncie. This time, of course, the undertaker's here. He comes out. Hunter runs out and the two destroy the undertaker with a chair with some help from Rick rude, uh, taker finally gets up and they scatter and man, Sean is really finding his voice as a heel. And I know through 1996, he was the lead baby face. And we certainly started 97 the same way, but his interviews and his heel persona, his swagger, it feels like he's maybe better than ever here. And it's because he's working as a heel. I preferred him as a heel. You said last week on the show, you did as well. And although he might be a pain in the ass, man, his, he might uh, be, <laughs> he was he a, pain, was in a pain in the ass. This was good stuff, man. Him as a heel was just the perfect, perfect place for him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he emulated flair so much did Sean, uh, legacy wise and, and, uh, all those things, uh, it just seemed to make a lot of sense. And, and Sean was much more comfortable being a heel. Uh, and I, th I attribute some of that to the, the influence that Ric Flair had on Sean's in-ring game, uh, because Flair's Rick was at his best when he was a heel, he stuck around so long that, uh, you know, he became comfortable. He was like those pair, that old pair of house shoes, just, they're still ugly, but they fit. And, uh, so Sean was in a perfect role. There's, there was no reason for Sean Michaels to be unhappy at that point in time in his career. At least in my opinion, he, he was, he got cast, right. He was booked, right. Uh, and, uh, was a, just a phenomenal heel. And I think that that was a, a key booking, quite frankly, that, uh, that McMahon struck on and, and Sean loved the role. He was a beatable heel. Uh, and I, I couldn't see us doing it any differently. Conrad, it seemed like it just worked. No doubt. Uh, now it's time for our main event. We've got Bret Hart beating Goldust with the sharpshooter in 12 minutes and 48 seconds. Bret will not break the hold. Shawn Michaels and Helmsley hit the ring, attacking Bret with the help of Rude and China, uh, which winds up with Owen and Bulldog and the return of Jim the Anvil Neidhart. Meltzer would say it's funny to see Neidhart attack Rude, who by agreement isn't allowed to receive any blows due to his legal settlement with WCW, and Rude didn't seem too happy about it. Brett didn't sell for Michaels either. And finally the undertaker came out and the ring was cleared except for Brett Michaels and undertaker as the show went off the air and then taker choke slammed both at the same time. So they're doing that because they're starting to promote some three-way main events on the house shows with the undertaker, Brett and Sean, but it's cool to see Neidhart back. Bruce has told the story that occasionally, and this time specifically Stu would call up and, and, and try to sweet talk Vince McMahon and, uh, finding some work for the old rhino. And, and here comes, uh, Jim, yeah. the anvil Neidhart, uh, rude probably didn't pass out that memo to Neidhart. Hey man, uh, you can't attack me. I took that Lloyd's of London settlement and uh, <laughs> I can't, I can't cooperate. You can tell he's awkward about all of this. Uh, but Brett and Sean not cooperating with either one that was apparent here too. And I wonder in, with the benefit of hindsight, cause we never really saw that from Brett. He was always super professional, but w when, when this happens now in front of the camera, you think there's a little chip on his shoulder about the meeting he had with Vince earlier in the day has to be I'm right? sure it was, it was life changing yes. Conrad. It was career changing. Yes. And he thought his, his, uh, he was being, un, uh, you know, he was being removed from his home and it was just, uh, sure. I'm sure it had an effect on Brett mentally, uh, quite frankly. So. He was having some tough times. 
Brett was. And it was sad to see him in that regard because he really didn't deserve it. This is a special show, the first Raw from Madison Square Garden. I'm glad we got to break it down. Let's talk about the business of it for a minute. Uh, there's 14,615 fans in the building. Uh, they had cut down um, and, and did a lot of production kills and made it look tighter because, of course, we know we can fit 20,000 in there, but we had it set up for 14,615 14, fans to be there. Only 10,672 of them were paying customers. They did 97,000 and change in merch that are 258 grand at the gate. And Meltzer would say, while there have been larger paid attendances for live raw tapings with the high New York ticket prices, this is a bigger live gate for any raw taping in history. So it doesn't just break raw tapings. It breaks nitro tapings as well. Nobody had drawn $258,000. So I just want to be clear that even though it's not sold out, and even though there's a lot of paper, it's still the biggest gate at this point in raw or nitro history. So by all measure, that's a success, right? But when it comes to the ratings, nitro does a 3.69 and raw does a 2.33 nitro wins in major fashion. But what Meltzer points out is that the tape draw the week before in Muncie, Indiana, it did a 2.54. This live raw from Madison Square Garden only does a 2.33. So this is a much bigger and more hyped show from New York City, from the Mecca, from MSG. We've hyped it. We've told you important and that it's important. We've sold it like it was important. We've really focused on it. And the tape show from Indiana the week prior had more viewers. That has to be frustrating. Where on the one hand, you got your chest puffed out, man. We set an all-time record for for revenue right. at the gate. But not only did Nitro beat us, that's not really new. They've been beating us for a year. But damn, our tape show last week had more people watch it. That has Crazy. to be frustrating, right? Yeah, it's frustrating and, and head scratching. Yeah, head scratching. It's like uh, recently in the at the Grand Slam event, Arthur Ashe. You know, we a great crowd you know, thousands upon thousands of fans there. Uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was an interesting thing. How do you explain that? How do you explain the fact that, you know, nitro or excuse me, uh, AEW does what, uh, about around a million viewers Yes. on a, on a big time hype show that's loaded yes. with five title matches. You know, how do you justify, how do you explain that? I don't know the answer to that, that conundrum. I really don't, uh, cause you know, you'd think that we, we were providing the audience with what they wanted to see is all of our top programs, all the titles that were significant, uh, getting, a uh, you know, getting, a some exposure. So when you don't have those massive numbers that you are hoping for, it's hard to explain why that happened. Wu Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Wu Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time world heavyweight champion. Tell them, Nate. Wu Wings, legendary flavors, world championship wings. Woo! Wu Wings. Yeah! Woo woo! Uh, we got a lot of questions about this show. There's no way we'll get to them all. Let's do a few though. Eric wants okay. to know what are some of JR's favorite moments in wrestling that took place in Madison square garden? Well, uh, personally, I would say, uh, I, I did several angles there. Uh, I did, a you know, I did some business with triple H there. Uh, that was, uh, fun and, uh, unique, uh, the night that Batista came back. Uh, and saved me from a match with triple H was kind of significant, to be honest with you. I, I didn't, I never really liked being involved in those in-ring issues. And the reason for that is not my ego It's my, I didn't think I was talented enough to pull off some of that stuff. And, uh, 
So, you know, that's, that's kind of the way I saw that deal. Uh, that was a big moment. Uh, Austin and I versus China and triple H and the Georgia dome was a big thing on raw, uh, at least for me. And that's what you asked me. Yeah. So, uh, but that was a big thing. Uh, you know, Lawler and I in a tag here, you know, we had a couple of tag matches, uh, on raw, on raw. Uh, my favorite one was Regal and Lance storm who took great care of us. Two highly skilled pros that, uh, understood their role as just as I and Lawler understood our role. I felt bad for Lawler because of all the partners he could have. He got the worst worker in the whole damn crew. So <laughs> I'm glad that. But it worked. It worked out pretty good. It worked out pretty good. And but I, I'm 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 pleased that they saved some pretty good stuff for me to do in the garden. Uh, at least that's that's my looking at it. You know, I did, they didn't put me in the, the water so deep I couldn't handle it. It was a different thing than when I was uh, partnering with Lawler against uh, Michael Cole and uh, uh, Jake Hager. It was just a different feel because. Uh, you know, I, I, I just didn't like the, the more people involved in the equation for an inexperienced performer like me is unsettling. You know, you're going to be in the right place. You're going to be doing this. You got to go over here when that happens, you got to do this deal. So it was challenging to say the least, but I had a lot of fun moments in the garden. And again, as a, as a performer to some degree, which I'll say some degree with the eyebrows up, uh, it worked out, it worked out nicely. I didn't like doing them because again, I didn't think I was uh, good enough. And I also didn't believe that, uh, uh, you know, that's what you want to do. I mean, it's like, don't screw this up, JR. Cause we're, again, we're working without a net Conrad. You got an inexperienced guy that has never not been officially or trained to do these things. And you're doing it from the world's most famous arena on our number one television show. There's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure there. Especially when you add my play by play roles role to that scenario. So it was uh interesting times to say the least. And there were there were there were a chance there were there were some fun things that we did that I that I had I enjoyed being a part of. But but all in all, I didn't really feel comfortable doing those things just because of my skill level. Coaster boy, Mike says no question here. I just want to say the last five months of 1997 are among the most important in WWF history. I think you could probably go back to the fight in June with Brett and Sean. And then from there forward, that Canadian stampede show in July, uh, that SummerSlam in, in August, where of course we know Austin gets hurt and Brett wins the title. Uh, everything that happened in September, which we've covered between last week and this week. And then we know Brian Pillman's going to pass away and the hell in a cell in October and DX really starts to get some steam. The screw job in November, man, what a crazy handful of months here. Back to back to back. It's yeah, um, it was, it was challenging, especially in my talent relations role because you know, talents are uneasy. Yeah. They're seeing a, they're seeing one of their heroes, one of the legends of our entire company ever, uh, let go S essentially with Brett. So it was, uh, it was hard. It was a, it wasn't a fun place to work at times during that era, even though we were building a brand and many of us didn't even realize how important that brand was going to be that in, ended up leading to the company going public. Uh, uh and that was crucial at it, its financial stability to the, uh, the operation, but it was hard, man. It was hard. It was hard. I hated to see Brett leave. I missed him. He was always fun to talk to. You know, if you had, a, if I had a question, a talent relations oriented question, I always knew that I'd get an honest answer for him and not a political answer. So, uh, and I, 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 I utilize those guys, those guys, meaning like guys like Taker and Brett were confidants. They were guys that I could go to and say, Hey, what I got a little conundrum here. I got a little problem here. How do you, how would you suggest I address this matter? And they would give me the honest opinion on how they would address the matter. And it was normally great advice. So it was, uh, but it was a crucial time. It was a very important time for all of us. 
there's a question here from Michael that I'm going to, I'm going to change up a little bit. He writes, since you got to see the WCW and WWF versions of cactus Jack, which did you prefer? But rather than ask that, let me ask this in the WWF, would you, or just overall his whole career, did you like one character better than another? Like when, when he first came in, I was disappointed. He couldn't be cactus Jack. All right. Then I sort of fell in love with the mankind character and understood you know, all of the nuance that he had built right. into that character and thought it was phenomenal. And I thought dude love was cool as like a one-off, but the more dude love hung around, the more I was like, uh, I kind of miss mankind. <laughs> uh, so I was, I was really excited here to see cactus Jack, but did you have a favorite character of the three? Well, uh, the, the interview that I did with Mick, that piece of business where he ended up getting me in the mandible claw, yes. uh, was very, uh, uh, positive it worked out really really well and it became such a cult favorite that uh, at the time we were doing it we certainly didn't have the foresight to say well this is it uh but i really liked that piece of business that we did with mankind i thought it got him over more than anything that we could have done and i think mick would agree with that uh quite frankly but i was always a cactus jack guy i i love the character cactus jack and, uh, I was disappointed that when we first got him, we had to reinvent Mick because we couldn't use that character at that time. So, but I'm a cactus Jack guy. I, I enjoyed, uh, that character and that personification of what Mick was trying to get over. It was a funny thing. You know, he, he was so popular, so beloved. So it's hard to say, uh, you know, it's hard to say what you could have done better. You couldn't do anything in the beginning. We had to reinvent Mick. We had to figure out a way to get mankind on television in a, in a provocative, unique way. And we felt the way to do that was just to tell a story. And, uh, so that's what we did. And it, it seemed to work. Okay. The dude love thing came out of left field. I had no idea that was even, that was just, just such a unique thing. And, uh, that was largely off that home video that, uh, Mick, uh, recorded way back in the day. So I, but I'm a man, I'm a, I was always, it still am. Um, uh, a cactus Jack guy, just old time's sake, I guess uh, you know, they're all lovable characters, but I, I was probably a cactus Jack guy more than any other of the personifications. Great question here from drew Landry. He says, did you talk to Brett at all that day? Did you know about the meeting with Vince and Brett? What was your response when you found out the result of the meeting? So we kind of covered the last two questions, but do you remember speaking with Brett? before, during, or after the show, uh, does this come up his meeting with Vince? Well, that doesn't come up, but we did talk, uh, yeah. you know, I always enjoyed talking to Brett and he always gave me good insight on his matches, uh, that I could some material that I could hang my hat on, so to speak, no pun intended. So, uh, uh, so we talked, but we, when you get in those scenarios, the last thing I wanted to do is to bring up such a negative yes. vibe, n negative experience that he just had with the boss. Yes. So, uh, I try to make sure I didn't talk about those topics as much as, as, uh, one might, I just didn't feel like it's timely. Wasn't a place to the, or the time to say, Hey, Brett, I'm really sorry about what's going on. I mean, he knows that. So I didn't want to go back there. And relive that again, what he, he is, what he just uh, sampled. So it was, uh, it was tough, tough day, but yeah, I, I definitely talked to Brett and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every, I enjoyed the last conversation I had with Brett a lot. So that was not that long ago. So it's, uh, it was, a uh, unique times, man. I, times that I had never experienced and, uh, especially when it dealt with a talent as, uh, significant as Bret Hart. Really fun uh, question here from Yambag Jones. He says, uh, how much did people tease Vince over the years for how he flopped when he took the stunner? Oh, he got, he got rid unmercifully. <laughs> <laughs> I can always say I didn't take the ugliest stunner. No, he did not. Uh, but, uh, Hey, look, I admire the fact that he did it and that he, he, he kind of humbled himself to becoming a, a wrestler, uh, to some degree, he, he became, he, he was just, he became Austin's nemesis and, and the, and the nemesis went beyond, uh, 
uh, normal when you got the president and the owner of the <clears throat> part of me of the company, uh, to, to get physical and you catch him with your finish and Vince sold the hell out of it. The audience lo loved tremendously, uh, just pop big time for it. And he knew we're off to something big because there's no way that the, uh, the owner of the company with his ego and so forth and so on as a heel, uh, was going to, uh, you know, uh, it was, it was going to be the last time we heard from Vince based on what Austin did to him. And there were other stunners over time, uh, quite frankly, but you knew that was coming too, but that was fine. Everything can't be the massive surprise, but I, I really, I, I thought, uh, the stunner was the way to launch the Austin McMahon scenario, because there's nothing in the attitude era, in my view, came close to comparing to, uh, uh that angle, that marriage, that, uh, booking. And so it was good. It was good. Uh, and, and Vince was perfect in that role. I've always said that he and Stephanie were probably the two best heels in the attitude era. And I'm not saying that to kiss their ass, you know, or to, to find a job or whatever. It's just, they were perfect for those roles and they have been preparing for those roles in the eyes of the public uh, for a long, long time. And they carried their load. They, they did really, really well. And it helped us a lot. So Stephanie and Vince were huge assets to the attitude era, uh, at least in my opinion, because they had an issue with Austin. Sure. And, and it, it, it accomplished what we were looking for. We weren't looking for more matches for Steve. We knew that that would hopefully get, we get there on health, health wise and so forth, but they, uh, they did a great job. They did a great job and, and it became wonderful heels. And I'm glad that we had them because if we hadn't had them, that would have been a, a harder transition to make Conrad. Soft custard has a great compliment for you that we'll talk about after the question, Mr. Ross, I use your seasoning on just about everything I cook and <laughs> gifted your main event mustard to my dad for father's day. And he loves it. As far as this show goes, do you think had Steve not been injured at this time, Vince would have been ready to go with him and Brett at survivor series for the title, as opposed to a sequel to WrestleMania 13 or as a sequel to WrestleMania 13, or was it going to be Sean no matter what? No, now, I think Austin was on his way to, to the title. Isn't uh, that crazy to think about though? Like realistically, if Austin doesn't get dumped on his head, maybe the screw job doesn't happen. That never really clicked for me until just now. Great question yeah. from soft custard, because we've all talked about and had a lot of fun talking about how, if one thing changes a little bit here or there now, of course, we're making some assumptions. How would you have gotten the intercontinental title off of, uh, Steve between August and November, if that really was going to be the plan, would they have wanted to save that match for WrestleMania? Um, could I, have. I could see it go a lot of different ways, but it is interesting yeah. to think, Hey man, if as, as Vince is throwing, what about this guy? What about that guy? As they're trying to come up with names and ideas, if Austin was at full speed, it feels like a no brainer. You could have just plugged him right in. Austin right. wins the belt at survivor series. The screw job doesn't happen. There's not all these crazy hurt feelings. Brett just goes over to WCW and it's business as usual, but none of that really happens. And if, if it does, ha if it would have happened that way, would there have been an undertaker, Shawn Michaels casket match at the Royal rumble? Would Sean have injured his back? It could have like, it's really fun to think about if Owen doesn't drop Austin here and at SummerSlam, a lot of wrestling history could have changed. It would have changed. Yeah. No doubt about it. You're right. You're right on. You're spot on Connie. Uh, it would have changed, but the, the, it, if Austin's health was going to improve, which it did, uh, and he got more accustomed to, uh, using his limited skills because of the neck deal. Uh, you know, he's the guy, I mean, we were, we were even, even a guy that couldn't, couldn't wrestle full time. Uh, he's going to be the guy period. And you know, his merchandise was still selling. There's a lot of measurables and when people come and raw was doing good gates because they got to see Austin. They knew Austin would be there. We didn't, they didn't know what capacity, but they knew that they were going to get to see stone Cold, and they're going to see stone Cold raise hell. 
And that's what they wanted. It's amazing to think, you know, that this is sort of where we are and, uh, and how it all shook out and how it could have been so much different. And you might be thinking that when you eat a pretty bland dinner tonight and you think, man, I should have had some JR's all purpose seasoning, but you can get it folks. JR's BBQ.com has got your hookup main event mustard is in there for dad. You heard it was a hit for father's day. It's a hit for any occasion that Chipotle ketchup yep. is a home run too. Uh, JR even likes that as a steak sauce. But yep. maybe the barbecue sauce is what everybody's coming back for. We're in a reorder situation, folks, and they've got gifts <laughs> for every occasion. But this time of year, man, football season, it's grilling season every single weekend. Uh, and our, our family doesn't do without the all-purpose seasoning. And the rumor is, last we spoke, that hot sauce is getting closer by the day. What's up? Jim? Very much. Yeah, very much closer. Uh, uh, it's in the warehouse. It's just a matter of getting taking the inventory. Uh, getting organized in, uh, inside wise internally, as I mentioned, uh, and I'm really excited about where this, uh, hot sauce is going to go. We worked on it for over a year. I think we've got to come up with something that's good. Uh, and, uh, I, I hope everybody, you know, try a bottle, check it out. And, uh, JR's BBQ.com can handle all those issues, but you're right, Conrad. It makes a, it's a very, uh, unique gift idea. And I think people like food for gifts. I, I do. Uh, you know, you, you, it hangs around on your kitchen shelf and, uh, you know, it's just a perfect, uh, little, you know, I'm thinking about you, try this out. You're going to love this. And I think men, especially, and I know, I know it's not just for men. Uh, that's a hair color. Uh, the, the, uh, but the hot sauce is a, I think it's going to be a hit. Uh, I hope so give it a shot. It's like I said, it's. I just got a text while we were recording that we're getting some work done on that project today as we talk. So it's all good. It's just a, sometimes the things in that process move slower than one would like, but it is what it is. Let me tell you why you need to go. Uh, a couple of days ago, they ran an, uh, they ran an offer 25% off multiple items, including food. When you spend $25 or more. And you qualify to get a free signed tops trading card. Think about that folks, an autographed Jim Ross card. That's worth real money. Go to eBay and check that out. I can't believe JR is just giving it away, uh, but he wants you to try the, the sauce and the seasoning and the ketchup and the mustard, because he knows you're going to love it. And he knows you're going to be back. In fact, he's even rewarding you with gift boxes where you got the, uh, the OG bottle opener included, uh, and that hot sauce, man, it's coming. Go check it out. JR's BBQ.com. And, and listen, I understand a lot of folks order this for one time as a novelty and put it on the shelf, order two bottles, one to try and one to display, because when you try <laughs> it, you're going to open it up off the shelf and reorder. It's a fantastic product. There's a reason it's been around as long as it has people absolutely love it. My family included sincerely can't recommend it enough. JRSBBQ.com. And next week, dude, we're going to be back talking. One of our favorites. Latino heat himself, Mr. Eddie Guerrero will talk about his run in WCW in the early nineties, his rise to fame in AAA, uh, really becoming a breakout star in ECW. And then the incredible run with WCW and jumping to the WWF and having to leave because he had some demons, but then coming back and eventually becoming a main eventer and the top dog and the world champion. And unfortunately his untimely passing, but how really his passing led to a lot of positive change in the industry. And, and what a legacy he leaves behind with his, his lovely widow, uh, Vicky Guerrero, who I know we both think a lot of and, right. and, and in a weird way, the success of Dominic Mysterio, man, Dominic was on TV as a kid and, and, and rubbing elbows <laughs> with Eddie. And it's, it's a feel good story. It's a celebration yeah. of life. And we're doing it next week off for Eddie Guerrero. It should be great. Yeah, he was a, just so phenomenal. I spent a lot of time with Eddie, uh, and largely, uh, Eddie and his Bible. Cause I, if I could get him to read his Bible before we met, it's, it's through the savage beast a little bit. Uh, and I loved Eddie. I really did. He was just a, he, this, nobody had his engine, his motor. He's five, eight, five, nine. He beat Brock Lesnar in the cow palace to win the, the, the heavyweight title. Eddie Guerrero beat Brock Lesnar. One guy, six, four, 300, one guy's five, eight. Buck 80, buck 90, and they pulled it off. 
because Eddie had that in unique skill, Conrad, that we'll talk about next week. And as much as, uh, he, he just wrestled bigger than he was. Yes. And a lot of guys can't pull that off. They're always going to be a cruiser weight or what have you, whatever the junior heavyweight, whatever Eddie had that. He didn't want to be there. Eddie wanted to be wrestling with the big boys because he could. Yeah. And the, the basic fact, Conrad, he was just better than 99% of the guys he worked with. He was just phenomenal. And he became an entertainer, you know, the mama Sita stuff and the Papa Sita and mama Sita and stuff with him in China, uh, helped her too, quite frankly. So it'll be a real good show next week because Eddie, Eddie did have demons, but he overcame the demons and, uh, his untimely death was something that still moves me to this very day to, to think about it just, uh, it just does. And he left us way too early. But I'm sure honored and feel great that I got a chance to work with him. We're going to talk about him next week. We'll be back uh, in two weeks talking, ask JR anything. And if you've got a uh, question for Jim, it's easy, easy to participate uh, in the podcast. Uh, just go over to JR grilling on Twitter. That's at JR grilling. And you can ask your questions right now. Uh, in three weeks, we'll be back talking about no mercy 2002. Uh, which famously went down October 20th in uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas. The main event, almost a forgotten hell in a cell between Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker. We've also got uh, one hell of a tag team here Edge and Rey Mysterio teaming up to take on Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle. Triple H is going to be working with Kane to unify both uh, the, the World Heavyweight and the Intercontinental title. Uh, Jamie Noble will be working with the Jerry. How's this for a Styles Clash? Rob Van Dam and Ric Flair on pay-per-view. That should be a fun show to talk about. And then, of course, we'll round out the month of October with what else? Halloween Havoc 1992. A lot to unpack, as I like to say, on a show like that, <laughs> because you got Jake the Snake Roberts coming in for spin the wheel, make the deal, uh, and uh, it's going to be a coal miner's glove match. I don't think uh, Jake is excited to be there and lot to talk about on a show like that. So October is going to be a lot of fun here on grill and JR. Of course you get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And, uh, we hope you, uh, at least check out JR's BBQ.com and Hey, and if I can help you save some money, you know what to do. Go to save right. conrad.com. We'd be glad to hook you up there. I know there's a lot of families who have more month at the end of the money. And I work to help you remedy that project. Uh, so take a look, save with conrad.com, find out how much money you can save right now. And. We'll see you guys next week right here on Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thanks, Connie. Boomer Center, everybody. Enjoy your weekend, folks.